Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In 1838, Within a span of nine days, two battles between the U.S. military and the Seminole Indians occurred near the Loxahatchee River near present-day Jupiter, Florida. The second of these is generally accepted as the last great battle of the Second Seminole War, for which visitors to the Loxahatchee Battlefield Park can witness annual reenactments. In the first battle, on January 15, 1838, the Seminole routed a landing party of 55 sailors and 25 soldiers. On January 24th, 1838, Major General Thomas S. Jessup, accompanied by 1,500 troops, stormed the headwaters of the Loxahatchee River, where he met 300 Seminoles in battle. When Jessup's army came into Jupiter in 1838, it was the largest army assembled during the Seven Year War, and the battle would be known as the Battle of the Loxahatchee River. The Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists, or LBP, protect and safeguard the Loxahatchee Battlefield Park along with the 6,000-year-old prehistoric Native American occupation area contained therein. Joining us today to discuss the LBP's efforts, the park, and to provide an overview of these battle significance is is the Vice President of the LBP, Andrew Foster. Andrew Foster, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Well, thank you, Patrick, for having me. Andrew Foster, you're the Vice President of the LBP, the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists. What is the LBP? Uh, Well, we're uh, an organization uh, based in Jupiter. Uh, We are in the the River Bend Park, which is just west of the town. Uh, It turns out that there were two battles uh, pertaining to the Second Seminole War that occurred there. There was a a group of people trying to find this battlefield because it had become temporarily lost. And uh, there was a group of people such as uh, Steve Carr and Jeff Whitman many others who didn't know each other at the time, and they were all looking for the same battlefield, and eventually they all wound up coming together on this same site, and uh, there were, as I said, two battles. Uh, The first one is one of the rare naval engagements on land uh, engaging the Seminoles, and it almost became a massacre. Uh, About 60 sailors came ashore looking for the Seminoles and uh, were ambushed, and uh, most of the officers were shot in the first volley, and a young Uh, ensign by the name of Johnson took command and did a fighting retreat and made it back to their boats and uh, and, uh, went back to Fort Pierce and engaged uh, with uh, General Jessup, who then marched on Jupiter with almost 1,600 men to engage only 600 Seminoles. And the Seminoles stood their ground. They were not going to go no matter what the forces were. But, of course, uh, prudence uh, got the better of them, and they were already packing, had the women and children and elderly already, you know, making a break for it, and they stood their ground. Uh, and eventually they relented, and uh, it would, uh, I don't want to get too much of the details, but it's fascinating that this site had two battles, and one was a naval engagement of all things on dry land. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting park. How long has this park been in existence? Uh, well, the, the park itself got going, I believe, the late 80s, the land was acquired. Uh, There was a uh, a, a fruit and orange tree uh, farm that was there uh, for many, many years, and uh, we found out later that they were actually giving a tour for that battlefield before, then when they were gone, it kind of became forgotten, but uh, uh, yeah, the the park has been, it became a, uh, sorry, it became a trailer park for a while called Riverbend, and then the county acquired the land and uh, became a, a nature park. Uh, to begin with. Once they uh, refound the uh, site and realized what was there, then they they were not going to develop the park and and it was saved from there. All right, which came first, the park or the battlefield preservationists? Uh, Well, they were pretty close to each other. The land was acquired by the park, but they weren't stopping people from going out there. And the preservationist group was actually starting about the mid 
nine, so they weren't far off from each other. Uh, you know, the park wasn't doing anything. It had, it, it wasn't developed enough yet to let people in uh, for say. You know, there was no activities or, or paths or anything else you could go on. But uh, the uh, yeah, somewhere about the mid '90s, I believe, is when they finally got it rolling and started to uh, you know become a park. And the preservationist groups were the, were now you know going full tilt trying to save the, the the historical site. They haven't been doing battle reenactments for a very long time, have they? No, I, we've only had, uh, I think we're just about on our fourth one, and uh, it, so far that has been the best one. Uh, we let one of our uh, reenactment, friend, uh, reenactment friends, uh, Matt Mills, uh, take control and orchestrate it. Uh, he did a fine job. Uh, we were very impressed very impressed with what he did and uh you know they, they really fell in line and i think they outdid themselves this year they they finally uh, got got to do something we'd never seen before or tried they carried the u.s and the seminal flag out onto the battlefield which was impressive what does a weekend day out at the battlefield offer visitors there are two parks technically there's a river bend park is the main park but nestled uh, in the park is what they call Battlefield Park, is where is protected uh, for all the historical site. Uh, there were two villages actually in there, and well, originally from the Seminoles, and there are burial mounds that date back to 4,000 years we found in there. On the weekends, if you come out on, uh, during the season, uh, we offer uh, free walking battlefield tours where we take them out. Uh, there are markers out there, and there's a trail, and uh, there's a giant oak tree, uh, which we uh, named uh, the Tree of Tears because the Trail of Tears actually came right through Jupiter at one point. And there is a tree written about by Dr. Mott uh, in the book Into the Wilderness, and it refers to a tree that fits the description. I mean, it's, we know it's not the tree, but we refer to it in our tour. Uh, it takes about an hour, and we take you all the way to what we call Indian Crossing, where the main battle occurred, and educate people about, you know, what was going on here and, you know, how, what kind of a battle it was. Uh, you know, there was the Tennessee Volunteers, and there was a skirmish there on the river, and a bit of an argument between Jessup and, you know, things of that nature. Why is it so important to preserve this battlefield? Well, it, it's American history. Little of the Seminole War history has been preserved. I mean, Florida, for some reason, doesn't seem, it's not like up north where if you, you know, stumble across a cannon up there from the Civil War, my God, you know, there's a monument built immediately. The, the Seminole Wars have gotten very little, you know, air, airplay, as I would say. They just don't seem to get what they deserve. And, you know, it's amazing that we had a 40, over a 40-year war. And when I was in school as a kid, I knew more about the Seminoles than the teachers did, which was bewildering to me. But, uh, you know, a history of this nature, we had 20-something casualties on this battlefield. The Seminoles, to the best of our knowledge, lost somewhere between six and eight. You know, that's a interesting odds when you think of it, 300 against almost 1,600, and they only lost maybe six or eight people, and we lost over 20. But, you know, as they say, Americans fought and died on this battlefield on both sides, and, you know, that is important. You know, that, that's history that we need to know and we need to remember, and it shouldn't be forgotten. So it, it needs to be preserved. It deserves to be preserved. Quick programming note for our listeners. This interview is actually conducted in two parts. Andrew here discusses the biannual Convocation of Seminole Wars Historians that was to be held in 2021 and hosted by the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists. Just a little uh, quick thing about the LBP. Uh, we are going to be the lucky ones to host the convocation in 2021. Uh, Dade had one, and uh, uh, the Okeechobee did the last one, and that's an educational uh, event. Uh, if anyone's interested, they can look on the Loxahatchee Battlefield page and uh, find out the particular dates of April of uh, 2021. All right, so there's been a change. What happened to the dates for the convocation of Seminole Wars historians that the Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationists were to host in 2021? Well, uh, originally uh, we had planned the convocation for this month of April 2021, and uh, unfortunately with COVID, uh, you know, we work out of the Palm Beach County Park System, and uh, we have to follow their rules and regulations, and it was unfortunately and sadly putting a damper on what we could and could not do. But, you know, we, we've got to follow their guidelines, and, you know, we understand it. You know, we had a lot of things planned, and it really put a kibosh on a lot of it. And we were 
until the last minute trying to decide what we were going to do, how we were going to do it. We were thinking of live streaming, and it just didn't seem to have the, in our opinion, the impact of a personal face-to-face contact. Uh, So we were having one of our uh, meetings pertaining to the convocation. We had invited Steve Rink to also attend this meeting since he was, uh, you know, part of it. And uh, the interestingly part, uh, part is that I was thinking of a possible solution, but wanted to ask uh, Steve what his opinion was of it. And uh, he actually interjected for us and brought it up and said, look, if you know the convocation is such an issue with not non-face-to-face and trying to make this all work, why don't we just simply move it to next year of 2022? That would give other organizations a chance to catch their breath, and uh, hopefully we'll get past the COVID. And we were all like, sounds like a great idea to us. So uh, we were able to uh, change a lot of uh, things around. And uh, so far at this point, uh, as of today, we're still uh, shooting for April, uh, the weekend of April 1st through the 3rd of 2022. And we're hoping by then everything will be all clear and everybody can come and not be wishing they were there and not follow, restri- you know, stuck with restrictions and everything else. But it gave us a chance to breathe a little easier. And, uh, you know, Steve fortunately stepped in and said that. And uh, I guess there are other organizations who were also of the mind that they didn't think they were going to be able to make their dates as well. And that gave them another chance to get another year uh, in preparation. So in the long run, I think it's going to benefit both them, the participants, and us, and giving giving us a chance to you know to shine, not trying to do it over the internet. And it's not never quite the same feel. I, I'd rather be there in person and learn the history than you know try to do it through Skype or Zoom and and hope that it works. If you know what I'm saying. What did you plan for the convocation? Well, uh, they have. Uh, we are setting up with the Jupiter Lighthouse, where we're going to do our uh, first gathering. And uh, the Lighthouse uh, Historical Society is more than happy to accommodate us, uh, which should be very interesting. And you know, get together with the hors d'oeuvres and talk history. And uh, then we're going to do the rest of our program uh, at the uh, Civic Center. What is the significance of the Jupiter Lighthouse? The Jupiter Lighthouse is a pre-Civil War historical site. Uh, they actually started before the Civil War. During the Civil War, they, one of the components was removed to keep either side from deciding to destroy it. So it was knocked out of commission during the Civil War, and then after the Civil War was over, then magically the part reappeared and they were able to keep it going. But it is a huge historical site here in Jupiter. There is a large historical society that runs and operates it now. Uh, it was run and maintained by the Coast Guard for, one, for many years, and then they've turned it over to them. And now Palm Beach County uh, runs and uh, maintains the facility. What are the lighthouse's ties to the Seminole Wars? It was after the Seminole Wars, so it has no direct connection, although, you know, there were rumors for years that they had had something to do with it, that that there was a fire with them. But actually, that was the uh, lighthouse down in the Keys that was overrun and uh, burned by the Seminoles. But unfortunately, there is no significance, but it is such a large uh, historical site in Jupiter that uh, it kind of fit in, in the air. But it is a site and a surrounding site that was pre seminal native culture that lived there for thousands of years. So uh, that in itself is a large historical uh, significance to this area. What else are you planning for the convocation? We are going to have uh, several speakers, of course, attend and talk about various uh, historical. We are trying to get one of our seminal friends to attend, and we'd love to get him to talk. We're trying to work that out with him. I don't have the list uh, directly in front of me, but uh, I know that they have several speakers, and uh, several of them are were re, uh, you know, changing the date and everything. And so far, everybody seems to be on board still. So we're going to cross our fingers and hope everything is uh, perfect when that happens. <laughs> What should people expect to hear in presentations? We try to focus on the Seminole Wars and local uh, history. I know that we have some local speakers. We have a, a few from out of town that are going to come down here and uh, stay to, for the weekend and do various presentations on uh, uh, local and uh, Seminole history. Are we going to expect a visit from Captain Coe? Well, uh, at one point it was suggested. Um, 
as of uh, this point in time, I haven't been officially asked, but uh, they they did tell me they were uh, considering him. Uh, I would be certainly honored to if they decided to, but uh, if if somebody bows out or can't make it, I wouldn't be surprised if Captain Coe does show up. What would he talk about? Interestingly is that he writes about the Second Seminole Wars from D.C. at the time when he was working there and talks and even mentions the two battles that occurred in Jupiter and then winds up living here in Jupiter and dies here at the age of 98. It would be a fascinating tie-in. Uh, it, it, it certainly could be done. So the convocation got postponed, and the annual reenactment for last January, what happened to that? The uh, reenactment is of the two battles that took place here in Jupiter, and uh, normally uh, we try to do a reenactment around the time of the actual battle. We're, we're, we're right close together. Uh, there was a a skirmish that occurred uh, of an exploratory force led by Powell to find where the Seminoles were, and it almost became Powell's massacre because uh, they were uh, led into an ambush and made it out with their lives and uh, reported to General Jessup, which returned with an almost 1,600 men to march on Jupiter to face off a 300 Seminoles. So uh, it's fascinating because we have two battles in the same region, nine days apart. The first one is a army and naval land battle, which you don't hear much of those going on. And then the other is a very large contingency force marching on a village. And the Seminoles still stood their ground and fended off almost six to one odds, which is, in my opinion, uh, a, a real testament to the Seminoles and their resolve to defend themselves and to fight for their home and their very way of life. Now those two battles, did they take place within the grounds of the present day park? Yes, we are located in what they call Riverbend Park and there's an adjacent park that was formed known as Battlefield Park. It's uh, about 60, 65 acres reserved just for where the two battles took place. One was on one side of the river, and the other battle was on the other side of the river. So, like I said, they, they stood their ground and showed us that they were not going to run, no matter how many they threw at us. And what was the outcome of those battles? The battle took place in the afternoon and went on for a few hours. It just seemed to just delay. It was typical guerrilla warfare. They delayed the army and uh, inflicted many, many casualties compared to how many they sustained. Uh, we don't know the exact number, but we know between six and eight. We had 20-something people, I believe, died, and over 100 wounded. And what was their purpose? Uh, Jessup wanted to engage a large force, and when it was reported to him that a small force had engaged almost 300 Seminoles, he saw an opportunity to finally in his opinion, come down and, you know, put down a large force. It didn't quite work out the way that he had hoped. Uh, you know, the Seminoles, of course, dispersed as usual and left them standing there at the side of the river trying to figure out what to do. But uh, after that, of which, of course, they formed uh, Fort Jupiter and uh, took up residency there temporarily until they could parley with the Seminoles. You think the battle was accidental, at least in the first case, while the second was purposeful? The first battle was to respond to rumors that Seminoles were living at this village. So they sent an exploratory force of about 60 to 80 men. They eventually stumbled across a Seminole woman tending cattle and captured her and demanded to know where the village was, and she offered to take them to the village. Well, it of course was an ambush, and uh, several of the officers were shot in the first volley, including uh, the commander Powell. And a young uh, lieutenant who was not in uniform by the name of Johnson took over and uh, did a fighting retreat, which is what saved the men in the first place. After the first battle, Jessup decided to amass as many forces as he could muster to go find the elusive Seminoles. What did this entail? They uh, retreated to Fort Pierce, and uh, Jessup was uh, checking in with his forces and heard that what they had encountered and gathered every able-bodied man, which was every uh, soldier, sailor, marine, dragoon, anyone they could nail down and marched on Jupiter. And it took them nine days from the first battle to the second to march on Jupiter. That was not a pleasant march because they had to go almost to Lake Okeechobee. There were no roads. They couldn't get enough boats. When almost Okeechobee then turned in on the uh, Seminole Cattle Trail, which is now known as Indian Town Road, and in those days was you know five to ten feet wide, and you're trying to, and swamps on either side, you're trying to march 1,600 men. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Seminoles 
could hear them coming miles away, and they would actually do delay tactics. They weren't ready for them. They'd send two or three men ahead and just step in the road, start shooting wildly into the uh, soldiers, and then just disappear. Well, 1,600 men dispersing into the swamps meant it took hours to regroup and still march to Jupiter. So it was a wonderful delay tactic. How does the park actually restage this? It's more logistics than anything else. Eventually, they got on board, got excited about this, and let us do reenactment of Powell's battle because it was the biggest and the probably the easiest to reenact. At present, we only do the one. We're still discussing getting to do both battles. And if and when that finally occurs, we'd like to do one battle on Saturday, like Powell's battle, and then Jess's battle on Sunday. That way you'd actually get two different shows. And uh, we have several uh, naval reenactors that are just chomping at the bit to do this. So we're, we're, uh, <laughs> we'd love to oblige them, and it's coming in the future, we're hoping. But uh, so far, we're still just doing one battle. They did cancel out of concerns of COVID for the primary battle reenactment. However, they did decide to let us do a scaled-down version called Living History Day. We did have a a handful of reenactors doing demonstrations and talks at their uh, field tents, including seminal reenactors. We actually still had our uh, main cannon come to bear and shoot off several rounds in displays, but we didn't do a lot of advertising. We kept it scaled down, and apparently the county was very happy with the outcome. We weren't overwhelmed. Uh, Our very first reenactment surprised everybody, and we had nearly 2,500 people show up, and the county was hoping we wouldn't repeat that this year. And and it was only a few hundred, uh, probably about four or 500 at the most, spread out over two days. They decided to do a a Saturday and Sunday, and it worked out beautifully. Uh, It it was very nice. We got, of course, as the uh, apparently official photographer for this group, and most of your listeners who do know me know full well that I'm always at all these reenactments taking God knows how many hundreds and thousands of pictures, but got a lot of beautiful pictures, especially the cannons and the demonstrations. We even had a demonstrator here by the name of Jim O'Dell who did a naval show pertaining to a certain vessel that was during the, during the Civil Wars and had seen a little bit of the end of the Seminole Wars, but and uh, they would talk about how the seamen would do things, and you know they had a little fi- a little deck cannon they would shoot off. Andrew, you're an accomplished photographer. Tell us about photographic battle reenactments and living history engagements. What do you get out of this? Well, um, you know, people say I'm a great photographer, and I don't know about that. I consider myself an amateur photographer. I just love taking pictures. Uh, wildlife is my my main passion, but uh, the group, the historical group I'm in, asked me one day if I would take pictures while we're doing things, and I said certainly, and then they found out I knew how to put pictures on Facebook, and now I'm running their Facebook page, and uh, <laughs> so that kind of fell into that, but uh, I love going to the reenactments. I try my best to get the action shots where you see the flame coming out or, or interesting or fascinating photos. I mean, I, I don't like the standard, you stand there with a smiling pose. I like the neat stuff, and uh, I know you've used a few of my pictures, and I'm sure you like those. Uh, you know, it, it's fun. It's interesting. Uh, sometimes I get carried away, and I'll, I'll take like 2,000 photos in a session and then go, where, where did they all go? How did I take that many? But uh, it, it's it's definitely a lot of fun, and uh, it, keeps me, uh, it keeps me out of trouble, I think. What has photographing these engagements taught you about how battles were waged back in the day? Well, uh, it, it, it's fascinating to watch them. If, if you haven't gone, you know, for the people in your audience who haven't gone to a a reenactment, uh, it it is definitely worth going to because you learn the history and you watch how things unfold. And what you learn for that time period is they're still fighting in the Napoleonic style where the soldiers were just shown how to load a gun, told to stand in a line, point in the general direction and hope you hit something. The Seminoles, on the other hand, were a little smarter than that. They they learned early on that those were foolish tactics, and they had all learned to become accomplished hunters with their rifles. And they were shooting with better rifles. They actually had rifles where the U.S. Army were still shooting horrible muskets. And the tactic that the Seminoles employed were much better. The sad part for the Seminoles is they just didn't have the manpower against the U.S., so it had to be hit-and-run tactics to try to delay and, you know, run run the war out long enough until hopefully the U.S. would throw their hands up. It, it's neat. I, I go to several different uh, places and learn, you know, that, that they all had different tactics and how they approach things and everything. So the, the history is always interesting. And when was this held? It was actually probably
probably the weekend after we normally would. So it was actually at the very end of January is when we held it. Uh, it was after a uh, uh, big event up there north of Halify normally competes with us, but uh, we did it around the end of theirs. You know, but it was very scaled down, very low keyed, but it, it came off beautifully, and we were quite happy about that. It came off beautifully. Most of the reenactors got to camp out, stay on the battlefield until they were ready to go home. During this COVID slowdown, shutdown, lockdown, what events was the LBP working on for weekends? Yes, we uh, still do our program of called History in the Park. During the cooler part of the season, uh, we generally will invite historical speakers or you know anyone that has anything to do with, with history and living history. Last fall, you had a soldier reenactor of that period speak. What was his purpose? One of our uh, members and a well-known reenactor, Jim Flaherty, came out and did a uh, demonstration on period clothing, armaments of the time, and uh, actually told uh, some historical stories and such. And uh, Jim is uh, very well known through our, uh, throughout the reenactment uh, society here. And so how did the park innovate to get people to see these events remotely if they couldn't get out there in person? Yes, we have uh, uh, trying to keep people who can't who, or couldn't come out because of the COVID restrictions. We were only allowed to have so many people out. So uh, this year we have been doing uh, live streaming uh, through our Facebook uh, page and through our web page, uh, which we would hook up a link and you could uh, go on there and watch uh, them live stream it. Uh, we had another event uh, earlier in January, uh, which was a remembrance also on the fallen on both sides, both the Seminoles, the black Seminoles, and the soldiers. And uh, they do this every year. And this year they did a special one where they were remembering the Seminole children that were here in the villages that uh, had to go through all of this and uh, see their homes destroyed and pushed out by soldiers. So touch the soul a little more, shall we say, in this one. If somebody wants to visit the park now, what are the restrictions on their visit? Being that it's outdoors, they're not that restrictive. Uh, you know, they just don't want large gatherings, large crowds, uh, although they are lifting. They are, they, it is getting better and better as, as uh, more people are getting vaccinated and, you know, they're, they're easing up a bit. The most they might want is if you get into a crowd is to wear a mask and, uh, you know, not to get too many people too close. Uh, we have, like I say, still doing our history in the park once a month, uh, usually the second weekend. But we also, uh, every Saturday, uh, still run tours. But uh, we keep them to a, a minimal number. The county wants us not to, you know, we, we've taken tours. We've had 20 people before. But, you know, they're keeping us load of four or five people, unless it's a family group. And then we, we're actually anywhere from two to four of us are there as tour guides and we take them out on the tours and give them the history of what happened and we show them various sites so we're still active we're still doing various things but just not in the big crowds like we used to someone with great ties to the park is richard prozik who is richard prozik gee how much time do you have <laughs> uh richard is uh, a long time member of the loxahatchee battlefield preservationists he has a long-standing connection and history with this park. He is uh, Philadelphia-born, uh, came to Florida, wound up in Miami. There he became a police officer and later became a detective. But while he was down there, he had met a well-known archaeologist by the name of uh, Robert Carr, and the two of them became good friends, and he became very interested in the ancient uh, Mayans and also the Native Americans that were here from from before the Seminoles, and uh, so when he retired, he came up this area, decided to uh, found a nice house, decided that's where he was going to live, not realizing he had planted himself on another historical site which dealt with the Seminoles. And at first, he was not interested to him; that was too modern. But eventually he got very interested in it, fortunately, and uh, found out that uh, behind his house is where the Tennessee Volunteers stayed when they established Fort Jupiter. Uh, from there, he got involved with other people who were searching for Fort Jupiter and for uh, the battlefields that uh, we've mentioned earlier, and uh, took a very big interest in it. Uh, he got to the point where he was trying to promote change in our laws and 
you know, how how we react to historical sites. So he joined the uh, Palm Beach County historical branch of the government. So or officially he could not be a member of the Lockset Battlefield Preservations because that would be kind of a conflict, but he would attend meetings and such. And uh, over time, try to preserve this site, he invited Robert Carr up, who was an author- authoritative uh, archaeologist, and he could actually survey the area, found out that there were, uh, well, it indeed was a battlefield, but to him that was recent history. He got more, ex- uh, Robert Carr got more excited about the 4,000-year-old burial mounds that are in our park. This is why the Seminole stayed there, because there was already an established villages there left behind by the by the ancient ones that had left or died off. And uh, Richard uh, really did his research, really fought for this park, and with the help of the archaeologists, they were able to save the park. And in turn, he also wrote a book uh, known as The uh, Guns Across the Loxahatchee, which is still in print. We actually sell some uh, at our uh, at our place here. It's an old, old friend of uh, Frank Lawmer's, from what I understand. And, uh, they, they've known each other way too many years. Why was he given the Frank Lawmer Award? They decided to give him one of the Frank Lawmer Awards. They were worried. They didn't want to give it to him posthumously because uh, uh, Richard is uh, pushing 95 right now. And uh, as of recent, his health is deteriorating. Where was it given and when? Uh, we wanted to give it to him early. We didn't. We were afraid to wait too long. Uh, although Richard has been saying he's been dying since the day I've met him, so that's been a long time. So, But uh, very interesting man, very outspoken, uh, big into history, and uh, was definitely uh, the man for this award. Uh, Steve, bless his heart, drove all the way down from Dade City to Jupiter, uh, which is about three to three and a half hours, depending on which part you're from. So that's a good drive for him. And uh, we decided not to push uh, Richard too hard, so we decided to have it at his house. Uh, we gave him notice, fortunately enough, and he sat in a, his lawn chair in the garage as Steve uh, you know, presented this award to him. And he was tickled to death. He loved it. And at the end, uh, I presented Richard with a few pictures that uh, I had taken. One was of La- Mr. Lawmer and his wife. Uh, the other was of Frank Lawmer in uniform reenacting on the Dade battlefield and doing the announcing. And the other one was, of course, of one of our cannon fire from the weekend that he unfortunately did not get to come out to our reenactment. But uh, at his age, we understand. What are some parallels between the lives of Richard Prozick and Frank Lawmer when it comes to recognizing the Seminole Wars? Well, it, it has been said that uh, Richard was the Frank Lawmer of the Loxahatchee, because he, he he was just as enamored by it. He would follow every clue, every the typical detective, uh, digging up everything that he could, you know, learning from the others who were already here working on this project and uh, coming together with a lot of them. And uh, like I say, the book is, uh, is our mainstay in this park. It is, uh, you know, what a lot of the... Uh, uh, our park is ba- our uh, situation is based upon, and the the research and uh, you know the, all the other uh, important things pulled together, and he put it in this book. And uh, you know Richard used that book to fight for this park to do you know, and he put his life into it the last almost thirty years of uh, fighting for this park, and now everything's coming together. You know the county's working with us. We've got the uh, we've got a little money set aside from uh, for putting together a historical museum, an interpretive center, and a lot of things that Richard has found are going to go into that. You know, a little bit of everything. There's so many people coming together who have found artifacts who worked on this project. Hopefully, in the next few years, we will have this structure and everything will be in it. And of course, uh, uh, Richard's legacy will be there as well. What is the importance of a Richard Prozick or a Frank Lommer to ensuring this history is not lost? Sadly, you know, a lot of history would most likely would have been lost. Uh, it's people like that that put everything into saving what they know needs to be saved. Who knows what would have happened to Riverbend Park if people like Richard hadn't jumped on board and said, no, no, we can't develop it. And it's not that the county was going to do anything wrong. You know, we, we have mandates here that as... As our infrastructure grows and the population grows, you have to, you know, enlarge these parks and have, you know, facilities for these people. But, and Riverbend fit perfectly. It was in the right spot. But 
it was a historical site, and we needed to save it, and Richard embraced it wholeheartedly to jump in there and do everything he could to keep that from being developed. Uh, eventually, the county uh, saw it that way and realized what was going on, and they had acquired adjacent land. All of our ball fields and amenities are now in that park. Riverbend has now been kept a jewel, as they call it, in their park system because it's very little touched. There are equestrian trails and walking trails and boating, but there are no overdeveloping. In it. There's no ball fields. There's no tennis courts. There's nothing in there except for a few offices and just chickies. That's it. Andrew, what would you like to say in conclusion? We'd love to have everybody, if you ever can, come down to Riverbend and, uh, and see us in the park and see what we're about. We're all about educating the uh, public uh, when it comes to the battles and uh, the, the Seminoles, and uh, we are hoping to raise, of all things, the Seminole flag in our park soon, and we want to bring unity with the Seminoles to our park, and they are very interested in seeing this flag raised, and uh, I think they need to be represented, and we need to show everybody that history is a fundamental part of our lives. And we need to know it, we need to save it, and it needs to stay here. And to reiterate for our listeners, what's your website address? The Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationist.com. Loxahatchee Battlefield Preservationist.com. No, we'd love to keep it short, but <laughs> it is the long, drawn out name. Nobody else has it. Andrew Foster, thanks for joining us for The Seminal Wars. Hope we talk again soon. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation 2021. All rights reserved. Front bumper music The Devil's Garden, Roast 'em, provided by kind permission of Reedy Youngman. Back bumper music Second Seminole Win by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.